Let me just, uh, before we even go into the discussion, point you to the Clarin legal list. So if uh, there is any aspect that you would like to discuss with the Clarin uh, click in more detail that we may not uh, get around to during the discussion now anymore, I invite you to write to us uh, by using this email address, legal at lists.clarin.eu. Uh, where you can uh, post issues that you would like to discuss with us. Um, before, we, before I open the floor to your questions, uh, let me uh, add two more questions of mine. Um, I am sharing another screen with you and asking you to go to uh, menti.com and participate uh, in a very short two question survey. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, the link, the direct link to the survey in the chat, um, or you can enter the code that you can see on the, uh, on the top uh, half of the screen here. And I can see that we already have two answers. So what we would like to know from you is if you have already received GDPR requests relating specifically to language resources, uh, if you are in some way responsible for, for uh, well, for any uh, sort of data privacy issues at your institution. And I can see that you are um, either not in the position to receive these requests or that, uh, you do not have um, any problematic language resources or that you do not collect. Uh -huh. Now we have one person who has already received such a request. Um, so uh, yes, this is our, uh, the, the first issue that we wanted to talk about. So um, all that you have learned here so far uh, is of course uh, much more relevant to you if if you actually deal with specific uh, requests by data subjects. And I can see that uh, while the majority of you has not uh, received any requests so far, we do have uh, two people who have once received a request and one person who even uh, has often had to deal with such requests. Okay, um, let's uh, move on to our second question. Um, those of you, uh, who, but not only those of you who have, uh, who have already um, received requests, uh, may yes, uh, now please tell us which, uh, according to your, uh, according to your um, perception, which of the- uh, Sorry, right someone hand... raised their hand. I don't know if they want to- Yes, I'm getting to that just a oh, second. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're kindly asking you to give your answers and let us know which uh, of the rights defined in the GDPR you find most relevant. And while you answer this question, I'm inviting Tara to uh, share what she wants to say. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for this presentation. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank okay. you. Good. Um, just wondering, I often find that consent not being easy because of this option to withdraw. Um, I think legitimate interest is also another option for research. Um, have researchers considered that opting for legitimate interest to get rid of the issue of uh, consent withdrawal? By all means, if I, if I may. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, this is very much uh, an issue of, uh, this is a very practical issue. So there are some countries and institutions that are extremely attached to certain legal bases for the processing. Uh, in my experience, um, my Austrian and my German colleagues are uh, extremely attached to consent they want to uh, collect consent, uh, they want to process personal data for research purposes almost exclusively on the basis of consent. And uh, well, we can hypothesize that it's uh, uh, due to uh, the, the, the cultural context. Uh, the German, Germany, after all, is, is, is the, the Vaterland, uh, the, the, the uh, the, the, the country in which uh, the, the theory of informational self-determination originated from. Uh, 
so, um, and this is actually the motherland of um, data protection in Europe as well. Uh, so, uh, my German colleagues and my Austrian colleagues are extremely attached to, con to consent. Uh, myself, me, myself, as a lawyer, uh, I do agree wholeheartedly with Tara. Legitimate interest may be a better ground, it may be more adapted. So what I am trying to do in my practice, if, it's, uh, if I consider it, of course, uh, appropriate in the specific uh, circumstances, uh, I try to inform data subjects that although we collect their consent, we have an alternative ground available and that's legitimate interest. Um, so I would say that uh, I understand that academics want consent, especially in some countries, but I agree that legitimate interest might be uh, more adapted for research purposes. And then there is a third team. Um, these are my Scandinavian colleagues. And when I mean Scandinavian, uh, I specifically have um, uh, my colleagues from Finland and Estonia in mind who uh, are extremely attached to public interest. My personal opinion is that public interest is in the current legal framework in the countries that I practice in, that I know of, is not an appropriate legal ground. But uh, apparently in Finland and in Estonia, it absolutely is. Uh, and uh, as you know, Tara, the, the public interest, uh, if the requirements for public interest are fulfilled, then uh, we can forget about not only consent withdrawal, but we can also forget about requests to object, the right to object, because it's limited when public interest is, um, when, it, when the processing is for research purposes, and research is in public interest. So um, this is a huge issue in international projects uh, because researchers from different countries are attached to different uh, legal bases uh, and they don't consider it negotiable really because it's something that is very deeply in the uh, tradition, in the practice. Um, so it is, it is a huge issue. Uh, as, as a lawyer on a purely legal uh, level, I do agree with you. Legitimate interest, the best. <laughs> but uh, but um, this is not anonymous. Uh, other people think differently and, and I by all means understand them as well. Thank you. I hope I have answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Because the other problem with consent is you have to keep a register of consent. So it makes anonymity a bit more challenging. Of course, by all means, yes. Uh, then one may argue that, um, well, consent uh, that researchers are asking is what they refer to as ethical consent, that is not meant to fulfill the requirements of the GDPR, but instead, it's just a, a symbolic gesture and the real basis for processing is actually different, but we just ask what is referred to as ethical consent as a, as a, as a, as a formality. I think, and I don't know the rules on, on uh, clinical trials, but I think in the regulation on clinical trials, uh, there is something in that sense that distinguishes between the legal so to say, consent and the ethical uh, consent. So that's an option as well. It's very interesting that our uh, discussion immediately um, circles or, or, or uh, closes in on the issue of consent. And we can also see in, in our little survey here that consent is what most of our participants uh, feel is the most relevant defined in most relevant right defined in the GDPR uh, for for their work. So and um, I have me uh, working in Austria and together with a lot of uh, German colleagues, I have the the same perception as as you just said, Pavel. Um, for me, from a on purely practical, not a legal theoretical perspective, that consent is uh, 
an overwhelmingly important or uh, perceived as an overwhelmingly important aspect of the GDPR. I can maybe start with some, some thoughts on this um, consent. In, of course, uh, it, it was interesting that when uh, Power was explaining this consent and legitimate interest, then he said that it's like he's saying it as a lawyer. But I understand that the idea of um, his idea of this seminar was to give advice as a friend. But, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so to come back to this consent and, and other legal grounds, in principle, I agree that consent could protect uh, data subject rights the most. In principle, yes, I, I think that. In, in, but, but of course, it's debatable how this consent is asked and in, in, in very, very uh, not clear way and so on. But, but of course, when it comes to research, in reality, there is a lot of, a lot of data. And when you just really like firmly believe in consent, then at, at the end of the day, maybe you cannot do any research. So basically, you can't, don't have consents. It's like some old data. And so actually, you have option whether you do research or you don't do research. And, and, and the same, same idea is actually what GDPR also has about making data anonymous. So, so basically, yes, when you do all data anonymous, then GDPR really like, you, know, it's, you are on, on good side. On safe side, nothing happens to you. But the question is that, do you need this kind of data when you're just, you know, uh, uh, there is nothing left. So basically you delete everything, there is nothing left, and all personal data is removed. But the question is that then you cannot do any research to this data, because this data, maybe, maybe the data has value because it has personal data. And then you remove it. It's the same. The same thing is with this consent. Of course, it's it's very good ground. It protects rights and so on. But the reality is that at, uh, uh, when you when you can't ask for consent, and and of course it's case de dependent. When you're just acquiring this um, uh, personal data from data subject directly, then I don't see any problem how to get consent. But when you're collecting, I don't know. You're just collecting some web posts or or something. How realistic it is. And, and the question is that whether it's really following the spirit of GDPR when I start detective work. For instance, I, I discover one post, there is no name, and then I start surveillance. I try to find out where the person lives, what his phone number is, and then contact the person and say, yeah, I want to protect your privacy rights. I collected your anonymous post, and now I have figured out where you are living, and now, now I'm just approaching to sign this consent form. And I'm not sure that it's really uh, compatible with the GDPR. But anyway, a couple of thoughts. Thank you. I can see another raised hand. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's mine. Um, I wanted to just um, ask a few comments from the panel on uh, uh, yeah so the few people that answer the erasure or withdrawal, and maybe I don't know if uh, they are all uh, like me, uh, coming from a perspective of a data center or, or of a, an infrastructure of data. But the question is that. Uh, within uh, the network of clearing centers, of course, we are working very hard to uh, stay within certain uh, um, uh, principles of data integrity, of uh, versioning, et cetera. And uh, for us, the idea that at some point, uh, someone can come and subtract the parts of our, um, of our, of the corpus that they have deposited and uh, so uh, that opens up a lot of questions about should we then uh, change the handle of this resource? Should we, what, uh, is it the same resource? And uh, yeah, I was talking about Triple and other projects within EOSC. Now everybody would like to say, okay, this is a paper. This paper was based on this set of data that is versioned here. here. Even if you generate a new version of the data set, this, this version is still accessible so that you can replicate. And this, you know, GDPR, the fact that, I mean, the, uh, maybe there is an issue of obtaining the data, but the fact that it can break the integrity of the data at some point, for me, it's a little bit uh, uh, problematic. I don't say, of course, we should comply with the law, but uh, yeah, this is opens a question, I would say. I think that's a, a very important that? point. Yes, please, Esther, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um... I, I would like to ask a question in return, actually, w because uh, I hope that you take the message of this afternoon that transparency is very important. Eh? So if you can explain, uh, I would say, eh, why integrity is important and it, 
then it, you have a way to balance the interests. Uh, so if you have uh, with your infrastructure uh, a code of conduct th that documents examples, uh, like in this case, the research can no longer be verified. But in that case, we decided otherwise because we thought the interests of the data subject prevailed. Uh, I think that kind of discussion would really be helpful. And um, yeah, I, I'm curious what you think about that. I think that Esther, what what you raised uh, or what you mentioned also during your presentation already is actually one of the uh, one of the keys to this issue. So um, as as you are aware, uh, the CLIC has for a while. Uh, been uh, circling their thoughts around um, developing a code of conduct specifically for the Clarion community on uh, how to handle data privacy issues in the language research community. And I think this will be one of the keys to solving issues such, such as this one. And I think um, that specifically solving the issue of, of, of data privacy versus research reproducibility will be one of the core um, aspects of that that will not only apply for the clarion community, not even only for the humanities community, but for for uh, scientists and researchers around the world, basically. Um, and I think this will be one of the one of the key things to solve. But I I do agree that this is probably the most central concern that we have to have, because it's really too. Um, core basic interests that just they don't go together but they are they are equally important so this is um also from from a from a ideological perspective for the you know development of men and womankind um so to speak so now i'm sorry i'm uh, when i'm trying to wrap up i'm always um uh, go, going to the meta perspective as you can see uh before we we finish let me point you um for since consent was such a big issue today, uh, let me point you to one resource that might help you when uh, handling uh, fairly simple consent issues in your research. So if you would like to come up with a consent form that you can hand over to your, uh, to your research subjects for them to sign so that you can uh, perform research on their personal data, you can uh, use this resource uh, developed by our sister community by the ELDA working group of the DARIA infrastructure. Um, very uh, useful resource, I would say, and uh, currently only available in English. But if you feel that it is a resource that your community would benefit from if it were only in your own natural, uh, natural sorry, national language, then uh, we currently have a call for translations for this tool open. So that is uh, something I wanted to mention to you. Uh, as I said, if you have any more questions, if you would like to get in touch with the click today's presenters, um, then uh, I already uh, showed you the list that you can uh, email to. And with this, uh, let me give a big round of applause to our speakers today who gave us a really comprehensive overview um, of, well, everything that is relevant and more. So thanks for the headache. Um, <laughs> and with this, let me hand it back over to Francesca. So, um, yeah, just a few words to say that if you want to know more about the activities of the Clarion infrastructure, you can first and foremost join our Clarion News Flash, which comes out every month, and uh, also check the uh, events that are updated uh, and that uh, happen at a regular basis. Right now, most of the events are virtual, so you can attend anytime you like. We have uh, several funding opportunities available right now, in particular, uh, there is a call, an open call uh, for submissions for whoever has uh, uh, training materials that they have developed, uh, um, virtual training materials that they've developed using Clarin resources. And there is a small price attached to it for the best, uh, three best uh, materials. So just take a look at the call. The call is in link in, uh, with the, the Clarin annual conference call for papers, which is still open. So you can submit something if you want. You can follow us on Twitter. 
and check out for the next clearing cafes on the page or with the hashtag. You can also stay in touch with the Go Triple project under uh, www.gotriple.eu. And finally, next uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, weeks actually, we have the next cafe the, the, in April. Uh, the 15th, uh, drinking coffee in the afternoon with Czech Clarin. I understand there will be also some virtual Czech uh, cookies uh, to go with the cafe. It is one of our um, uh, consortia that is going to present their activities and I think it's going to be very interesting. interesting. So um, yeah, that's all for now and see you in two weeks. Mm -hmm.